tales for dark nights. When the doctor told me I only had about a year left to live, I took the news surprisingly well. Perhaps because my life's been so fucking empty for the last ten years that I didn't really feel like I was losing out all that much on life by ending it shortly. Ovarian cancer, caused by some strange, hard-to-diagnose syndrome inherited from my mother. She had died of something similar, according to my Aunt Elizabeth. My aunt had always been there for me, up until the shithead years where I ran away with a guy as a teenager, only to learn after a miscarriage that life with a barren wife is not very appealing. After that, my aunt was really all I had in life, and I was grateful when she offered me a place to stay while I got things in order. So, like I said, I wasn't that surprised or upset about it all. Not really, once I got past the initial reaction. I was determined to make the best of my last year, though. My aunt was retired now, and I did my best to help around the house and garden. At the time, I made my living producing scarves and other pretty meaningless things to sell to bored housewives who spent too much free time on Pinterest. Most of my hair had fallen out, so I had taken to wearing a perfumed scarf around my head. One I had made for myself, with silver spiderweb patterns. My family all seemed to have a knack for sewing. For a rare moment, I felt content as I sat on the tree swing, gazing up at the house. Coming back here was soothing to me, the pain somehow less harsh as I surrounded myself with familiar settings. I was tired all the time and the chemo made me sick as a dog. But as soon as I got in the door, I began to feel better. The house was built in two sections, meeting at a right angle, with verandas and widow's walks and all the trimmings of a Victorian manor house. The most unique thing about it was a spired turret that jutted up from the roof where the two halves of the house met, easily a full floor higher than the rest of the house. Rose trellises, overgrown with ivy, dotted the angled walls of the turret, ending just before the nearest windows on the third floor. As far back as I could remember, that turret had been off-limits. I'd always been curious about it, and as soon as I was old enough to notice it, I asked my aunt why I wasn't allowed to go up there. She would smile and assure me that when the time was right, I'd be led up there. Unsatisfied with that answer, I was determined to find a way. I searched everywhere, in the dozens of rooms. I tried the dumbwaiters. I even tried one time to see if I could reach the bottom of the trellises with a ladder, and was grounded for a week when the ladder fell and smashed into the garden greenhouse. Nothing I tried worked. Soon I accepted that there was probably nothing up there but junk, like every attic. As I gazed up at the turret, I thought I saw a face in the dark window. It was such a strange sight that it took me a moment to even realize what I'd seen. I told myself it had to have been a trick of the light. There was no way someone could be up there. The turret stairs, or whatever, had to have been walled off long before I'd ever lived there. I was starting to feel fatigued in the growing heat and dismissed the whole notion in favor of a nap. The chemo was getting to me, and even though I dreaded waking up to find more hair on my pillows, I relished sleep. Dreamless. Emotionless. A reprieve from my growing depression and pain. Sometimes, when I slept particularly deep, I could almost hear a distant voice singing, bringing me back to my childhood in the garden, with memories of a girl I used to play with. I had a happy childhood. Growing up in the large, three-story historical home, I had no lack of love from my aunt. Despite keeping a lucrative nursery and an immaculate private garden, she never failed to make time for her niece. When, on rare occasions, I did feel lonesome for company, I'd used to go into the garden and play with my imaginary friend. Well, I say friend, but she was really more like an imaginary twin sister. We both had the same blue eyes, same pointed nose, same smile, same 
Everything. Almost. The only difference between us was that my hair was dark and short, and hers long, flowing, and completely devoid of color. I called her Sylvia. We had the best of times pushing each other on a tree swing or braiding flowers to each other's hair. When I was done playing with her for the day, I'd come in from the garden and breathlessly tell my Aunt Elizabeth about all the adventures I had with Sylvia. Aunt Elizabeth would smile over her cup of rose tea and slowly shake her head when I asked why I could never play with Sylvia outside of the garden. Sylvia is a special girl. She's your responsibility as your special sister. She can't leave the house, but I promise you, she will always be with you. And I smiled at that, knowing in my young heart that Aunt was right. Sylvia was special, and I wanted to play with her forever. I grew up, of course, and Sylvia stopped showing up in the garden. I made new friends, and soon I almost, but not quite, forgot about my strange twin with the silver hair. My aunt was just playing along, knowing how important it was for a shy child like me to have a friend. I woke up an hour later to the sound of knocking on the front door. Pushing aside another depressing clot of hair on my pillow, I frowned when I noticed that some of it was silver. I knew that I was holding in a lot of stress that I should have been dealing with better, but nobody in my family grazed this fast. I checked myself in the mirror, but couldn't find any other silver against what was left of my own natural raven. I shrugged it off and went down to answer the door. It was Tim, a young college-aged guy who helped my aunt on the weekend with her garden, doing the harder work that neither my aunt or I had the physical strength to handle. I guess he was handsome, in that football jock kind of way. Blonde hair, blue eyes, rugged jawline. I didn't know him all that well, and I suppose that seeing someone on death's doorstep made him uncomfortable, because we never spoke all that much whenever we were around each other. I felt ugly with my thinning hair and sallow skin. I did my best to avoid him within the realms of politeness. After a few hours, I decided that I'd offer him some lunch, and carried some sandwiches and a jug of iced tea out into the yard. Tim was standing in the middle of the garden, staring blankly up at something in the sky, he looked like a dog, listening with one ear cocked, hearing something that nobody else could. I had to nudge his shoulder to get his attention. It was weird, like he'd been asleep while standing up. His eyes were dreamy when he looked down at me, and I could have sworn his pupils were bigger than normal. Tim then shook his head and accepted the tray with a grateful smile. We ate in awkward silence, both sitting on a garden bench. Do you guys have a guest visiting? He asked out of the blue midway through the meal. The question caught me off guard. No, nobody's here but us. My aunt is at the store. Why? I asked, putting my sandwich down on my lap. Oh, I guess I was just imagining things. Never mind. Uh, look, I gotta go pick up more mulch from the hardware store and stuff. Can, can you tell your aunt I'll be back tomorrow? He asked. There was disappointment in his voice. A mix of confusion and anxiety that wasn't normal for him. He left me alone among the flowers, only stopping to stare up at the sky again, before hurrying out of the yard. I followed his gaze this time, up to the turret. The windows were empty. My aunt got home later that evening, and she seemed more tired than usual. I guess she was getting on in years. All that hard work tending to her beloved flowers was finally catching up with her. We chatted about idle nothings over roasted ham, and again I felt compelled to ask about the turret. She seemed uncomfortable about the subject, especially when I told her about what Tim and I thought we'd seen. Oh, that's been falling apart for years. The floors are rotted to nearly nothing. It's safer to just leave it alone. Why not get Tim or someone to fix it? Well, I just just never got around to it, I guess. She left it at that, excusing herself to turn in early. The next morning was a little better, feeling well rested for a change. I took the car into town and decided to shop for something nice to cook for dinner as a thank you to my aunt. While waiting in line with my cart of groceries, I couldn't help but overhear two women ahead of me talking. 
I'm not usually much for eavesdropping, but I wanted something to distract myself from the odd mood since yesterday. Third guy this year. It's really starting to worry us. I heard Becky is holding a vigil. Maybe we should go and give her our support. It'd be good for her to get closure after that long... You kind of just have to assume, well, you know. The cashier finished checking them out, and it was my turn. Despite my better judgment, I asked the girl behind the counter what the two ladies had been talking about. Since I don't get out that much, I really didn't know much of anything that had happened in Red Oak since I left. Oh, that? It's tragic, really. About a year ago, Brian Crispin went missing. He went to a party on campus, and nobody's seen him since. Two other guys vanished, too. The police haven't got any leads. It's like they just up and disappeared. She nodded over towards a bulletin board near the store vestibule. Color photos Xeroxed onto bright blue paper. Three young men, all in the prime of life. I felt a cold sense of deja vu. They all had blonde hair and blue eyes. Just like Tim. I felt a wave of queasiness wash over me and quickly paid for my food without comment. I was sore by the time I pulled into the driveway and decided that I'd take a shower to soothe my muscles after putting away the groceries. A good hot shower and time to mull over all the strangeness. It felt good, the hot water cascading down my aching muscles and the white noise clearing my head of the creepy concerns. As I pulled my hand away from my lathered up scalp, more silver hair glittered on my hands. This time, though, the ends weren't from me, but from above. Clinging to the ceiling like cobwebs, I instantly shook my head, realizing it wasn't hair, but webbing. Disgusting! The house had its fair share of dust, but this was beyond normal. Hastily, I rinsed my hair and fled the shower and dressed to get dinner on the table. Do you remember the imaginary girl I used to play with as a kid? I asked my aunt over plates of baked ziti. This time, for sure, she wasn't meeting my eyes. She had grown distant over the last few weeks, distracted and almost evasive during our conversations. I don't recall. Why do you ask? Mm. Just thinking. Spending a lot of time in the garden brought up memories about playing with her in the garden. The silence between us was abnormal. My aunt was a talkative, almost overbearing woman, usually, and seeing her behave this way was making me uneasy. Well, perhaps I do remember a little. Children need friends, especially the lonely ones, she answered, leaving the subject closed for discussion, as she excused herself to take care of something in her room. Neither of us finished our meal that night, and I decided to occupy my troubled mind with my latest sewing project. The rat-a-tat of the machine always calmed me. Perhaps my life was barren, but it was comforting to know I could at least contribute small tokens of beauty to the world, however frivolous. A sudden and loud shuffling noise from above made me jump. Whatever it was, it was loud, like something heavy being moved across the floor. I turned off the machine and gazed up at the ceiling, puzzled. That was my aunt's room. What on earth? earth could she be moving at this late hour? Too rattled and pensive to concentrate on my work anymore, I decided to head upstairs to bed. As I made my way through the upstairs hallway, I stopped to look out the window overlooking the garden. It was another one of those rare moments of sublime tranquility. Only, uh, I wasn't the only one enjoying the late night air, it seemed. Something dark and bulky scampered across the yard. I almost considered just chalking it up to my imagination, but it darted forward again, right to the middle of the backyard, before standing still. I watched for several minutes, gripping the windowsill despite the thick cobwebs gathered on it, trying to make out who or what that shape was, and whether I should call 911. Just as quickly as it came, it ran off again. Too tired to put up with pointless police platitudes, I dismissed it as some kid taking a shortcut home. It wasn't an unusual sight in a backwater town like this. I just wished I knew what had made the stranger stand so still like that. The following morning, I went downstairs to the kitchen to get a start on breakfast. 
The sun was rising past the tree line surrounding the garden, and through the window over the kitchen sink I was shocked to see Tim was out in the yard. He wasn't supposed to be here. Not at seven in the morning. He was standing in the exact same spot the stranger was as yesterday, staring up blankly at the turret. This was too much. Whatever the hell was going on, I wanted answers. Pulling my robe closer, I moved to the back porch and called out to Tim loudly. He didn't seem to hear me, even though I had shouted at the top of my lungs. I called again, and he still ignored me. What the hell? Was he high or something? I marched over and gripped his shoulder, forcing him to turn and look at me, and then stepped back in disgust. His eyes were dilated, and there was drool oozing down his chin. He gripped at his crotch with one hand, obviously aroused. He was looking right through me, head cocked to one side, as if listening for something in the air. He wasn't looking at me. He was looking through me. I backed away quickly, afraid that Tim might attack me in his deranged state. Whatever the hell he was on, it had clearly driven him insane. I remembered stories about guys on PCP going berserk and tearing people apart with their bare hands, only brought down by multiple bullet wounds in their frenzy. But Tim didn't move towards me. Tim didn't even acknowledge my presence. He turned away and stared up at the turret, still rubbing at himself. Only when I followed his gaze did I see the flash of white at the window. It shimmered in the late afternoon sun and trickled down the ivy like water. That voice! I want to see her! I need to see her! He giggled like a schoolboy mooning over a first crush. Still backing away until my legs nudged against the tree swing, I could only stare in horror as Tim ran at the house. At first I thought he intended to smash through the plate glass patio door, but he swerved to the left directly underneath the turret, and whatever was slowly cascading down from the high window... It sparkled and shimmered, spreading out in some places, joining together again in long ropes of silvery white strands. Closer up now, it looked... It looked like hair. Long curtains and coils of it snaking down the wall like it was alive. By now, Tim was jumping and reaching for it with one hand, grunting lustily while trying to undo his belt buckle with his other with addled fingers. The hair joined together in front of his face, arching itself to meet at eye level, looking more than ever like a great coiled cord of silky strands. Then it struck, wrapping itself around Tim's neck with a cobra's speed. His hands no longer sought pleasure, but instead pulled on the insistent hairs. His eyes bulged and his tongue poked out horribly. Without any effort, the hair lifted Tim completely off the ground, still wrapping around his body as his feet kicked at the walls to either side, Hands still clawing as the hair carried him up, up and then through the high turret window. I dropped to my knees in shock, and then vomited. As if on cue, my aunt moved out from behind the greenhouse and stood over me. Her face was sad, but there wasn't any concern or fear on it. She patiently held my shoulder as I vomited again until there was nothing left to come up. There, there, dear. I knew I shouldn't have left you alone. You weren't supposed to see that yet, she whispered, more to herself than me. Arms still wrapped around my shaking shoulders, Aunt Elizabeth ushered me into the kitchen and made us both a strong pot of tea. Shouldn't we call the police? I asked when I was finally able to stop crying. Tim had been attacked, was probably dead. How could we sit here drinking tea while whatever monster living in our attic was probably eating Tim alive? There's no need, said Aunt Elizabeth, and poured tea into the cup in front of me, as well as a shot of something from a dark glass bottle. Drink that, dear. It'll make you feel better. I did. And it did. I always liked it when Aunt Elizabeth put brandy in the tea. Now she said, composing herself seriously. I'm going to need you to stay calm. There are things about our family that you need to know. 
If you think you've calmed down enough, I'll show you what's been up in our attic all these years. But you have to promise me that you won't scream. Screaming upsets her. Her? Her who? I almost lost it again there. Who the hell was my aunt talking about? It's better to just show you. Then you'll believe what I need to tell you. Aunt Elizabeth led the way upstairs to her bedroom. It was small and full of flowers from the garden. On the far wall was a large bookshelf, which I remembered had always seemed to be too big for such a small room. Its presence made sense now, as my aunt undid a hidden latch at the side and the whole thing swung forward to reveal a hidden staircase. Putting a finger to her lips, Aunt Elizabeth climbed the stairs, which went up in a long spiral, until finally ending at a locked door. I knew with dead certainty that this was the turret, and the home of whatever monster had eaten Tim, and likely eaten those other boys from town. The door didn't open onto an attic space full of junk, like I expected. The wide, circular room was carpeted and furnished, there were spider webs everywhere, hanging from the rafters, covering the bed and chairs, clinging to the walls. Everything was either blue, white, or silver. Everything, except for a clump of something red and wet near the open window at the far wall. I recoiled as I noticed that the spider webs were moving. It was hair. The same silver hair I had been seeing for the last several days. It was the same hair I had seen attack Tim. Meaning that the lump in the middle of the room was Tim. I gasped as the lump lurched around suddenly, only to be wound more tightly by the thousands of silvery hairs. Tim was like a bug in its cocoon, struggling to escape from the kiss of a spider. A shadow loomed over Tim's thrashing body, and as my eyes went up to the source of the shadow, my heart nearly stopped. Hanging from the ceiling by spidery limbs was an awful sight. From the waist up, the thing looked like a beautiful young woman, of about my age. Naked, although the countless silver hairs framing her face seemed to instinctively cover her like a loose robe. Her lower half was monstrous, ending at the hips in a wide blob of hard, black, spiked carapace. Eight long, clawed legs issued from the lower torso, supporting her against the ceiling. More grotesque still, that carapace gave way to a great, sucking maw just under her navel, and razor-sharp fangs on either side of it clicking with hungry anticipation as they drooled venomous fluid. I watched in sick fascination as the creature slowly lowered itself over Tim's still-cocooned body. The human-like part of her picked up the squirming mass and embraced it, lovingly. Tim stilled for a moment, and then tensed up as the massive mawed underside reared up and sank its fangs into his stomach. She continued to nuzzle his body as it struggled, like a patient lover. I couldn't watch any more, turning and burying my face into my aunt's shoulder. Her name is Sylvia, and she's your sister. She needs your help, my aunt whispered, stroking my back as she looked over my shoulder at the terrible monster hanging from the ceiling. I pulled back, shaking my head but my aunt cut me off before I could say anything. We're not human, dear. We're special. There's always twins. Your mother was my twin. You see, only one of us can live among humans, and the other ends up like your sister Sylvia. Your mother died just after you were born. It was my job to raise you two like my own, just like Sylvia will need you to raise her girls after she is gone. Our sisters are born to breed and die, while you and I are born to live 
and see the next generation through. The name explained it all. I hadn't imagined Sylvia. She had really been here this whole time. But that was wrong. How could this monster be the little girl I had loved so much all those years ago? It was unthinkable. Yet, as I turned to look at the monster now, I could see that we had the same blue eyes. Her smile was warm, and it was my smile. If not for the silver hair, we would be identical. Your sister has been feeding for a year now, because it's time for her to have her babies. We live for a long time, healthy and strong enough to protect our sisters. But once the younger twin becomes of age, they go into a state of metamorphosis and take the shape she has now. My aunt moved past me and reached up to brush Sylvia's cheek fondly. The monster mewled like a kitten nuzzling my aunt's hand while still hugging Tim's shrouded corpse to her breasts. She hunts by singing and lures men to her room. She's not evil. There is just no other way for her to live. She'd never survive without me to look after her. And neither will her daughters if you don't take up the responsibility. Does that make us monsters too? For letting this go on? Perhaps, but that's for you to decide. Aunt Elizabeth reached out for my hand, and despite my horror, I couldn't help but feel compelled to approach the monster that I was to call my sister. She purred as she lowered herself down to me, two of her great spider legs reaching down to pick up Tim's body and stick it up into the rafters. Her now free arms tentatively reached out as she gazed down at me, Little strands of silver hair tickled at my arms and legs, soft as silk. She's missed you, I think. It's very lonely here. She can't really have company like this, except for me. And, well, now you. Every girl needs a friend, after all. I looked back at my aunt and nodded. It was an unfair existence. It wasn't Sylvia's fault she was born like this. No more fair than my being eaten alive by cancer. I felt bad for Tim and the others. But somehow it wasn't enough to raise the same horror anymore. Instead, I felt my heart skip a beat when suddenly Sylvia wrapped her arms around my shoulders and kissed my cheek, just like when we played in the garden as children. It isn't one-sided either, dear. My aunt came up beside me and stroked my hair. The older of us have long lives and good health. Sylvia and her younger daughter will make sure of that for you. It's not a bad life, really. My time may come soon, but your life is just beginning now. You have a beautiful life ahead of you. I turned to look up at Sylvia to look up at the face I shared with her, the face of my dear twin sister, and smiled. A year and a half later, my aunt passed away in a tragic car accident. I still live in the same house I grew up in. I still tend the garden. The doctors are all amazed that my cancer has gone into complete remission, with four years past the point where I should have died. I'm healthier than I've been in years, and happier now that I have two beautiful little girls in my life. They're very close, as close as they can be. The adoption papers were already made up, and my new friends always ask, how can they look so much like me even though we're not related? I simply pass it off as good fortune, a blessing from above. What could bring you more joy than two beautiful little girls, one with dark hair, and one with hair as silver as spider silk. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.